Here's a short presentation on script formatting. As you listen to this presentation, please refer to the pages listed in Chapter 2 of Screenplay Writing the Picture and the Adobe Acrobat file entitled Spec and Shooting Script. To refer in more depth to specific formatting rules, I highly recommend Hillis Cole and Judith Haig's The Complete Guide to Standard Script Formats, the screenplay. You can buy it for cheap online at Amazon.com and elsewhere. First printed in 1983, it's a bit old school, but it's the closest thing there is to a screenwriting Bible. While its rules can seem confusing at times, even contradictory, it's the final word on most matters of script formatting. You don't have to have it for this class, of course, but if you really want to become a screenwriter, it's worth every penny. First, open the file name Spec and Shooting Scripts and take a close look at the formatting of the shooting script on pages 103 through 106. Then compare those same pages with those numbered 107 through 109. What are the main differences that you see? In shooting scripts, for example, the scenes are numbered. In spec scripts, they're not. In shooting scripts, you will see continued in caps and parentheses flush right at the bottom of the page to show that a scene is continuous. In spec scripts, you won't. You'll also see another continued in caps, flush left, in the upper left-hand corner of shooting scripts, but not in spec scripts. Shooting scripts also include camera directions like dissolve to and cut to. Spec scripts do not. Please do not use camera directions in your script. How can you write these without these elements? With a close-up shot for a shooting script, for example, you simply describe what is happening close up, like a facial expression, and we'll assume that every new scene is a cut to or dissolve to of some sort. The main thing is that you're the screenwriter and the director's the director, and he'll decide what camera shots to make and whether there's a cut to or dissolve to. Making those decisions isn't your job. You're just supposed to create a movie in our minds with vivid and memorable images and scenes. Please don't use a blank cover page for your script. Instead, include a title page printed on standard white cardstock for your cover page and a blank page of white cardstock as the last page. Use page 18 in your book as a guide for your title page and bind your script as described on page 19 using a three-hole puncher and only two brass brads, one on the top hole, the other on the bottom, no brad in the middle as shown on the page you're looking at. To format the basic page as noted on pages 20 through 21, please refer to Appendix, appendix A for the movie template, which you can use as a guide for the exact placement of script margins for such elements as scene headers, narrative, character names, dialogue, and parentheticals. You might even consider copying pages 408 through 409 on a large-scale copier so that you can hold your pages against it to the light to make sure your margins are correct. White space is incredibly important to scripts. When you read a book, a novel, or a book of nonfiction, for example, you're reading across the page. But when you're reading a screenplay, you're reading down the page. Give your reader a lot of white space, not too much, and not too many long blocks of text. No more than four lines of narration, long passages of description, or dialogue, long monologues or passages of exposition through dialogue. Always begin your scripts with fade in, flush left, followed by a colon. Please don't use fade in again anywhere else in your script. Some students confuse fade in with dissolve to, which they shouldn't be using in a spec script anyway. Every time you move to a new place or time in your script, you need to write a new scene heading, also called a slug line. If a character argues with another from a bedroom into the hallway and then into the kitchen, for example, you should have at least one scene heading for each room, a minimum of three. Always capitalize words in your slug lines and begin writing with the largest thing, a city, for example, on your left, and then work right in your scene towards the smallest things on your right, ending with the room your character is in and the time in that order each of the units of space and time separated by an M dash. 
You don't have to give us the exact time, just the time of day, evening, dusk, morning, afternoon, noon. Please don't confuse an M dash with a hyphen. An M dash is two unspaced hyphens typed together, usually with a space on either side of each place in your slug line. Even though doing so may seem unnecessarily repetitive, you must include all of the slug line elements in each new scene heading. In other words, don't use shortcuts and just write a room a character is in after you've written a previous slug line. All the previous elements should remain except for a change in setting or time. One advantage of using a program like Final Draft is that it memorizes slug lines for you so that you don't have to type in the entire line again, but simply hit return. If you're using a standard word processor like Microsoft Word, you can save yourself some time by simply copying the previous slug line and pasting it into a new one, making minor adjustments to the room or time change, for example. The most important purpose of a scene is to turn at least once. While description is important to narrative, static description is boring, and no description at all is totally ineffective. Try to give the sense of an entire scene in just a few short descriptive strokes. Anton Chekhov, the great Russian short story writer, once told a friend, to give the sense of a moonlit night, show the flash of moonlight off a piece of broken glass and a black dog in the shadows of the mill dam. Choosing just the right surprising details can give us an entire picture while also creating a movie in our minds. And remember, write only what we can see and hear. Don't interpret actions for us. For example, if you write that Jacob Arvitz is nervous, rewrite to show us how. If you write that he drums his fingers on his desk, you're writing a cliché detail for nervousness. Try to find something surprising. What does this individual character do to show nervousness? Pluck at his eyebrows? Rub the stubble along his neck? Pull at his earlobes? Invent something we've never seen before, particularly for this particular character. And please, even though you may see it written in a few sample scripts, don't write, we see or we hear. It's a sign of amateur screenwriting, even though a few professional screenwriters may still use it. Please write in present tense, as if the action is occurring right now, in this very moment. If you use a lot of is verbs, linking verbs, progressive verbs, and especially passive voice verbs, circle them in your writing and rewrite your sentences with strong, dramatic, active verbs. The verb walk is an active verb, but it's also a bit boring. If you use imaginative verbs like shuffle or stagger or amble, you're giving a clearer sense of the emotion of the verb. But also avoid what I call thesaurus-itis. You could say a character perambulates across the room. But because you're showing off, you're calling attention away from your character to yourself. Use your thesaurus to find the right word, not the fanciest. Not the one with the most numbers of syllables. <laughs> In fact, the more plainly and simply you write, for readability, the better. The simplest language can also be the most poetic. Dialogue is not the way people really speak. It turns ordinary speech into poetry by simplifying and condensing natural speech to its purest essence, often through indirection. For this reason, try to avoid writing what's called on-the-nose dialogue. What does this term mean? That people are saying exactly what they're thinking. And that's not what people often do. An argument between a wife and husband about whether to bake brownies at 350 or 400 degrees could be a continuation of an argument days before about whether to have a child. The wife wants one and the husband doesn't. People rarely say what they're actually thinking. To do so is to violate taboos. Think of your own families. Can you tell, you your, tell your sister Betty that she's fat because she binges on Hershey's chocolate kisses in the middle of the night? You can, but you risk everything. Honesty may be the best policy, but it's not particularly common in the human species. And that's not just because people lie. They also lie to themselves. And they lie for what they think are good reasons, to keep from hurting other people's feelings. Just remember that dialogue must do something dramatic in every scene. In a sense, dialogue is just another way of saying no over and over again. And no is the heart of all conflict. I want something, you say no. I persist, you say no again. I push hard, you shout no.
There's nothing more dramatic than two characters saying no to each other. Make every line of dialogue count. Don't have long conversations about the weather or politics. Don't have your characters imitate Hamlet's soliloquies. Don't have characters telling each other things they already know. Exposition through dialogue is a conflict killer. Powerful, moving dialogue, on the other hand, is the heart of all good scenes. And the scene is the most important vehicle for moving scripts toward drama. Here are two things to do when you've written dialogue. Read it aloud to a friend or have that friend read it back to you. If it sounds unnatural or if you or your friend stumble over the words, rewrite it. Yes, you may have characters who speak in dialect, but avoid misspelling words to show that dialect. Instead, leave words out and let syntax suggest the dialect. Very few people say, how are you doing? And very few of them pronounce the G and the ING. Therefore, there's no need to drop the G or use an apostrophe to suggest dialect. Most people say, how you doing? Just drop the R, and that does the trick without making your character seem stupid and you seem patronizing. I'll say it again. Leave a lot of white space in your script. Don't write over four lines of dialogue or long speeches or long passages of exposition through dialogue. If you want to deliver exposition, reveal it in the highest moments of conflict, especially to help us understand a character's motivations. But don't overdo it. How many times have you seen someone you love do something that baffled you? And then one day that person says something offhanded, almost throws the line away, and everything becomes clear about why that person does what she does. That's exactly the best way to deliver exposition, too. After we've asked many times why, and never thought we'd find out.